Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. And welcome to another group meditation sharing. And <clears throat> hello to all those in the chat room, those behind the screen. And uh, I hope wherever you are in the world, and there's many different places, some of you are up quite late. I think in Europe, it's quite late. It's probably a nice thing to do before bed just to come in to a, a group setting and sharing. Sometimes at night it is hard just to settle, isn't it? Like last night, for some reason, my body was very restless, a lot of restless energy in the body. And I had been out for a big walk. I think that may have contributed whatever reason, the body was a bit restless, a bit, a bit of tension. And it, even though I'd had a sit uh, and listen to a Dharma talk, probably about seven or eight o'clock at night, I sat for a couple of hours and then I just thought I'm going to lie down and just, it was quite early, and just watch the mind. And the mind was okay. It wasn't, it wasn't preoccupied with much, but the body had a lot of restlessness in it. And so I made the mistake of just lying there with this restlessness and quite a lot of heat because it was a bit hot for a couple of hours not sleeping. And, uh, and then I just thought, well, I'll just get up and sit. So I got up and sat. And I guess... One has to be uh, fortunate enough to be able to, to sit too. Some people can't always sit and break that um, restlessness that can happen when you're lying down trying to sleep. So I just sat for about, I don't know, 40 minutes, maybe an hour, and just noticing how before bed, if you sit in a meditative posture or however you sit, how the energy and the restlessness can really settle. So just simple, simple sitting watching the breath, being with the body, not fighting it, just being with the, the slight tension. And straight away I just noticed how the whole energy system just settles down and then I got back into bed. could have been 1 or 2 o'clock, I don't know what it was. And just such a different feeling in the body. So I recommend that to all of you people who might suffer from insomnia all those nights where you might have drunk a bit too much coffee or your body's restless or tense. As we get older, we notice these things more in the body, especially women in menopause. There can be a lot of um, tension, restlessness in the energy system. So just even if you don't want to, if you think it's not going to be effective, just to physically sit up for 20 minutes, half an hour, more if it feels right, no forcing here, it can make a huge impact on uh, the ability then to fall into a rest, restful sleep and the way it shifts without you doing anything, just that bare noticing <clears throat> in a more upright position uh, has quite a profound effect on the energetic system. So that's just something I wanted to share, given that some people are doing this before bed, and it would be interesting just for you to notice if you find you sleep better and get off better before doing these sorts of things. And also just as an encouragement for others who might have sleep issues and uh, just sharing from last night's experience. So before we begin the meditation, I uh, just need to mention in case some of you only do the meditation and don't stick to the end with the Q&As, that um, we're going on retreat for a little bit, myself and I, Jatindria, so there won't be a session next fortnight. The next one will be, I think it's the 6th 
6th of March. Just checking. Um, so in a month's time, on the Monday is still the 6th of March. So I'll post those details on both our website and on YouTube. But um, just in case you don't stick around for the Q&A, and I'll also mention it at the end for those of you people who only just come for the Q&A or something. Okay, my computer's doing weird things. And I think uh, everyone is obviously hearing me. There's no messages that you can't hear or see me. So welcome to those. Some of you have come for the first time. And generally we do a spontaneous meditation guidance and then have a bit of time for Q&A if you've never been before. So that's kind of the loose structure. Okay, so for today's session, I take a slightly different approach but still pointing to uh, the essence of the practice. So what I'm going to ask you all to do is just at the beginning of the meditation to start by getting in a comfortable position now, seated on the floor or if you're in a chair, just to check your posture, make sure that your back is upright, comfortable and relaxed. Relaxed and upright are really the two key factors. And just at the beginning to keep your eyes gently open and to gaze at this bell that I'm about to put on the screen, this meditation bell. So if you can just relax your eyes and bring, hopefully that's in a good position on your screen, And just use the object of the bell to gaze at. Letting all other distractions in your visual field, in your auditory field, and in your kinesthetic field, just be on the periphery as you direct your attention and your gaze to this bell. You're not trying to block all the other sense impressions. You allow them to come and go. It's not a problem. But your main focus is just gently on this bell as a visual object. Whatever names, labels or judgments come up about this bell, Just see that and let that go too. Let even the name bell or meditation bell become redundant. We're just seeing, we're just looking. Without any concepts interfering. but equally without trying to force the concepts away. We can simply notice how full of analysis and concepts the mind is. And now as I ring the bell, 
I just ask you to bring your attention to listening to the sound fully. Again, without indulging in any analysis. So this time, simply listening. I'll do it once more. And just fully bring your attention to the process of listening. as you gaze at the bell, as you allow the sounds to come and go, see if you can notice your own awareness And by this I mean, how is it possible for you when I say to gaze at the bell or to listen to the sound? How is it possible for you to do that without conscious awareness? when nothing's being said, when there's simply silence and one single object which you're gently trying, attempting to bring more into focus. What happens to your own mind? What we notice is that the mind starts to become more unified. More whole. More expansive. So rather than chasing after thoughts or even just getting swept away by thoughts, emotions, subconscious musings, awareness comes more into presence.
So now if it feels more comfortable for you to close your eyes for the remainder of the meditation, please do so. Or if you feel comfortable just continuing the, the eyes open gazing meditation with the bell, then please do that. But regardless of whether the eyes are open or closed, the first step in this meditation is simply to notice, to recognize your own awareness. Without conscious awareness, you couldn't be aware of any objects anyway. So just notice that within you that is aware of an object. A sound, a sight, a smell, a feeling sensation, an emotion, or a thought. And how do we recognize this phenomena that we call awareness? when it's not even a phenomena. If I was to ask you, or you were to ask me to prove that I'm consciously aware What would you show me? How would you describe it? So we recognize as well this great mystery of awareness or consciousness, pure consciousness, that lies beyond and above anything that can be described or felt or seen, or touched, and so on. And it's so close to you. It's so integral to you that most of the time, most people don't recognize it and ignore it or even devalue it. But without it, we couldn't function in the world.
But more importantly, it's this awareness, this intrinsic knowing, however you want to word it, because it's not the word. It's this capacity, if you like, that all the masters point us back to as the most important thing to recognize and abide in on this spiritual path. So one of the most famous teachings in the Dzogchen tradition given by one of the founders of Dzogchen, one of the fathers, Garib Dorje. And he condensed the essence of the teaching of the path in just three statements. And for those of you who are like me, who appreciate simplicity and directness and not too much intellectualizing or analysis. This teaching is all you need. So the three statements first start off with this simple statement of recognize your own awareness. And once you recognize your own awareness, don't try to grab it or hold on to it or cling to it. Don't start objectifying it, analyzing it or explaining it. Simply notice its subtlety, its formlessness. And the way it flows. Notice its expansiveness. So we do this in a gentle, natural way because our own awareness is the most natural thing. It is the most intrinsic thing to our whole being. And once we have recognized our awareness, the next statement is to abide in it, to choose the state of presence. How do we do that? you ask. Simply by resting, relaxing and remembering. So again, if you've listened to a number of different masters from all traditions, They say it in different ways. But they're all reminding us to 
to just come home, to come back again and again. You can call it mindfulness with wisdom. You call, can call it resting in the I am, just the pure presence. or recognizing the supreme knowing, the supreme being. The words and pointers aren't that much important. But whatever words work to wake you up to your own inherent being, awareness, then that's why there's so many different words. But don't get lost in the words. Just choose the state of presence. Abide in that. Distractions come in all sorts of shapes and sizes of pleasant and unpleasant disguises of things the mind wants to hold on to or push away. But when you simply remember to abide in presence. That stuff doesn't stick. Or it doesn't stick around for as long as it used to. Because none of that stuff is me or mine. And the third statement made by Garab Dorje. to encourage us to just keep practicing in this way was continue with confidence in liberation. So this is really, really important and profound. Once we recognize this inherent awareness or knowing, rigpa, or what's often called sati sampajanya, mindfulness with clear comprehension. And we practice learning how to rest in it. In all postures, in all situations, whether it's sitting on the cushion or doing any other task.
then we should learn to rest into the confidence that comes from that without looking for any results or having any expectations that I am going to get something. Because whenever there's an I that creeps in in any subtle, smelly way, we're going down the wrong path. So the confidence in liberation that we develop is not about getting something for me. The liberation comes when the me starts to dissipate. The me who wants spiritual experiences, spiritual powers, spiritual attainments, spiritual recognition. That's what liberation is. It's liberation from me, from the ego. Because when you learn to rest in and recognize awareness more and more, you understand that it's impersonal. It's transcendent of all personalities, all genders, all races, religions, all shapes and sizes, all intelligence, success or failure. So it belongs to nobody and yet it's inherent to everybody. And when we practice gently resting into it more and more, becoming more familiar with it, we get a taste of freedom. Even for a short moment, to be free from this debilitating sense of a self, of an ego self. So just to recap as we come towards the end of this meditation, the three statements, very simple, very direct for practice. Recognize your own awareness. Two. Choose the state of presence. And three, continue with confidence in liberation.
Okay, so just coming out from the formal meditation. But the only thing we're coming out of is the formal meditation. The awareness doesn't change. And the recognition of the awareness and the resting into it doesn't need to change either. It's just that there's more distractions, more sensory input. And that's why we sit and establish the formal sitting because it's like any exercise. It strengthens our capacity. Uh, so that's why the encouragement is to do formal sitting <clears throat> in a way that's helpful for you. You can't force yourself to be sitting for 12 hours a day or something, but just enough so that you're feeling the benefits of it, that when you go into so-called normal life or post-meditation, those understandings and benefits continue. <clears throat> so that when there's a, a reaction of a liking, a strong, intense liking or disliking to something in your environment, you know, straight away you come back to, hopefully, <clears throat> there'll be a moment where you perhaps don't. But there'll be a recognition, ah, this is a reaction and, and the awareness can become more into the foreground of just watching that. And as soon as you learn to rest in and recognize awareness in that moment of presence, then you're no longer lost in the forest of liking and disliking, the forest of samsara, because awareness itself wakes you up and is curative. So things just naturally drop off because you can't be resting in awareness and having a reaction at the same time. Even if there's a reaction, awareness can come, if awareness can come to the foreground, that reaction won't last, won't be able to last as long. Because the difference between awareness and everything else is that awareness is a state of not clinging, of not identifying to this ego self. So before I take any questions on that or other topics of meditation, just to mention that on, on my channel there's a couple of versions of Garib Dorje's teaching, The Three Statements it's called, and it's in the Zogchen playlist. And that has a more, um, well, actually it's a reading of the commentaries as well from that teaching. So has a lot more padding around it, more explanations for those who might find it helpful. But for some people it may not be helpful, might just be more, more concepts. So it's there if you feel that it might be helpful. But if you just want to work with those three statements and you have a clear understanding in your own mind and heart about what it means and what it's pointing to, just stick with that. It's very simple. Okay. So no questions yet. That's a good sign because you all understand it. You understand what you should be doing. So has anyone got any questions about what we mean by conscious awareness or presence or Rigpa, or what are the other words? The self in the Advaita, the I am without the I. People are asking from different things to add. 
am I teaching a form of Buddhism, says Debbie Sue. Um, do you mean now or on my channel? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm a Buddhist nun, which you may have gathered. So there are many forms of Buddhism, but like I said at the beginning of the meditation, after a while you start to recognise that all the masters, the great masters, the authentic masters, are all pointing us back to the same thing. It's a path to liberation. And whether that path is a Buddhist path or a Christian path or an Advaita path or a Sufi path, they're just different words and paths that are pointing us back to the essence. And when we recognise that essence and go deeper and deeper, it becomes a liberating path. So it's not that important at one level. So David's saying, it's strange to think people will be listening to your recordings long after you're gone. Maybe, if YouTube still exists, huh? You don't know what's going to happen in the world. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, I'm reading teachings, ancient, ancient teachings that we can be so grateful that they have been preserved uh, through an oral tradition for many years and through other means of writing them down. Uh, thousands of years people have preserved the Upanishads, the Buddhist suttas and sutras. So we're lucky, we're very fortunate that we have these gifts because so much of it's being diluted these days and you know, all sorts of stuff's going on to take out the purity of of the teaching. So we, we're lucky that there's still, we still have access to some pure teachings. Okay. So question, does meditation leading to expanding awareness without mind analyze? think you're asking when we expand our awareness in meditation does the mind start stop analyzing if that's your question I think it is or is it done without analyzing yeah it doesn't mean that thoughts don't come in but the whole analytical process because analysis requires you to jump on board and to start analysing, you know, what do you do when you analyse something? You hold on to a thought and you go to the next thought and you, the whole conditioning process starts and you start pulling it to pieces and it's an intellectual process. So, yeah, when the mind is expansive, resting in awareness, certainly the analytical process stops. But having said that, there's also another function of the mind that goes beyond analysis and intellectualizing which may confuse some people because what can happen and it happens automatically is that there's a cognition and there's still an intelligence there that understands that is understanding the process and is having insights but these insights into the nature of the mind into the nature of reality happen without the same sort of analytical process that we're used to when it comes to the thinking mind, okay? So you might have seen this yourself. You, you, you go into a deep meditation and you have this profound understanding and insight into something, you know, maybe the nature of impermanence or the nature of how the mind clings or gets stuck to something. And it's, trans, it's a transformative insight, which obviously requires a certain cognition and intelligence. But you recognise that you didn't really think about it. You didn't analyse it and evaluate it. What happens 
when we kind of let the thinking mind rest or die, something else takes over, okay, automatically. And this is, you could call it like just a greater intelligence that we all have within us. And it figures things out in a different way. It, insights come without us making them come, okay? So I'm not sure if that's helpful, but it, this is what confidence in liberation means. When we learn to trust awareness more and rest in it, it does the work, okay? And you, 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 the more you practice, the more you see this, you have more and more of these insights, these awakening moments, these aha moments that just happen naturally because awareness has that capacity and power and that's where you find true intelligence, not conditioned intelligence, educated intelligence, real intelligence. <clears throat> and it's not, uh, it's not a personal um, attribute. It's not something you learned at school. It's what you're born with. And this is, um, this practice is just learning to tap into that. <clears throat> so which leads on to John's question, which is, could you say something more about awareness as being universal? And, and that's what I mean, is that, you know, in that meditation, it was asking people to just look and investigate and explore this nature of awareness that you know you have, you know you are, more accurately, but it's not something you can claim as being yours personally. And we have this shared understanding that we're all conscious, aware beings. And as human beings, we have the capacity to be self-reflexive, to actually know awareness as awareness. And, and most animals don't, you know. They're pure awareness most of the time unless they're somewhat dysfunctional through living with us. But generally they're not neurotic. They're just aware, pure awareness when the moment calls for flight or fight, they do it and then they just come back to being empty awareness, more in touch with their um, instinctive nature. But most of them don't have an understanding that they're aware and that's what makes a human birth so precious. We have the capacity to, to inquire into it, to be self-reflexive. And then to recognise this awareness, this conscious awareness, this pure consciousness, whatever you want to call it, pervades the whole universe. Animals have it. Sentient beings have this awareness. And to some extent, the whole universe is alive with this awareness and consciousness. It's, um, you know, it's, it's an, an aliveness, but it doesn't have the same sort of sentience or self-reflexive sentience that is possible as a human being. And really it's only, these are again words that might confuse and confound people, but it's only really when you, you learn to rest in it and become more familiar with it that that understanding of what we mean when we say universal is. Because people can start to imagine and conceptualise, oh, this is, this is, even in meditation, oh, this is awareness and I'm feeling love, and it becomes a conceptual meditation, you know, and we have ideas about the universe, but the universe, again, is just an idea. But when awareness is just awareness that pervades everything, then you're not there as a self-conscious personality that's interfering with this. But there's a, that cognition that I said before, that, that intelligence that 
transcends rational intelligence that recognizes and knows awareness as being what it is, which is what we are in our pure form when all this baggage drops away. That doesn't mean we have to drop dead to experience it or become unconscious, right? But it just means that those things can drop away and yet awareness, which is not me, not personal, um, comes to the fore, right? So, oh, where did we go after John? Crikey. Okay, so after John, some nice messages, the love bomb, lots of loving. (laughs) Blessings on the full snow moon. I didn't know it was a snow moon. I don't even know what a snow moon is. I have to look it up. But, yes, we had our full moon last night, our full moon um what we do is take the precepts and have a sit together and reaffirm our practice here at the hermitage and we do that on the full moon days and the new moon days i say question from eve is regarding the dream life why do i think it's so real for that matter why do i think that my waking life is so real because it's part of our conditioning and uh There's not really much more to say than that, that it's all just the process of conditioning both in this lifetime and many lifetimes of learning to identify with the unreal rather than the real. And, of course, it's quite helpful to, at one level, take the waking life as real in a relative sense so that we can function because if we, you know, if everything becomes too amorphous, it's very hard to function. And uh, some sometimes in practice you get to that stage where you really can't function in the world because there's very little that you can hold on to and that can be very challenging and you need supports for that. Um, but it's a, it's a bit like Jesus said, um, Be in the world, but not of it. So it's that balance of recognising that the dream life is a dream, and we know that, it's not real, although when we're dreaming sometimes it can feel very real. And it's the same process in waking life. It is a dream. It's like a dream. And when we take it as real, as who and what we are, what you know, what's really going on, then we suffer. But it's the middle way between um, denying it because that's the other extreme that people go on this path, on the spiritual path. If you hear a teaching that says it's, it's not real, it's a dream, and so we don't really know that in, our, in the core of our being. So we just come up with these, um, what do you say, you know, these reactive statements, oh, it's not real, nothing matters anymore, and then we just cut off. They call it spiritual bypassing. You know, there's no self, there's no me, it's all a dream, therefore nothing matters. So we cut off from our emotions, we cut off from our empathy towards the suffering, we cut off from taking it seriously in a way that is helpful for for ourselves and the world. So it's a real balancing act. And that's what we're, that's why we practice, to learn how to uh, become integrated and also natural and authentic, but not fooled or deluded by the world and appearances, okay? Who is it says, Nagarjuna says, appearances aren't the problem. All right, so it doesn't matter about the appearances you see in a dream or the appearances you see in real life. They're not the problem. It's the clinging to them, the identification and attachment to them. That's the problem. Because when we 
take them as real, it means we're taking them as me and mine often, most of the time. It's all about me. When we don't take it personally, it's just a dream. But we're wise enough, hopefully, to understand that that doesn't mean people don't suffer and that we shouldn't do things to help them, right? But we do it in with wisdom, knowing that they're appearances. Okay, so Bruce is asking, what is the process for deciding to go on a retreat in your tradition? Um, no real process, just, uh, well, we do have a three-month Vasa or rains retreat that happens traditionally uh, from any time between June, July for three months, and that's in alignment with the Theravadan forest tradition, Theravadan tradition, and that's generally a time of retreat. Long story about that, I won't go there, but uh, we're just having a retreat because uh, we've got an opportunity. <laughs> so that's how we decided we got an opportunity <laughs> debbie sue says are you taking students taking them where i mean we're all here now and i'm babbling on so if it's helpful then you're learning but uh in terms of uh, i don't know what you're asking debbie sue if i'm taking one-on-one -on -one or, or you know no no i don't do that just come on these live streams from time to time and uh, respond to some questions on the comments and obviously put up all the teachings from all the great masters. So there, there's so many teachers already out there that I'm offering, myself included, if it's helpful. And um, But, you know, I'm a student as well. I'm still studying my own mind, learning to understand it more and more. So, lovely bird sounds in the background. Yes, they're very, very chatty this morning and partly because I, I left the window open because it's quite stuffy in here. So the magpies, the wattle birds, hopefully you'll hear a um, whip bird and all other birds that I can't identify. They're all quite chatty this morning. It's quite lovely. Does breathe, oh, sorry, does breathing meditation retain a kind of ego as the watcher? Well, it depends. Any meditation can retain the smell of the ego. It's not, and there's nothing wrong with breathing meditation if you understand that the watcher is not, not really a subject and that subject starts to dissolve. Breathing meditation is is really just a way to tranquilize the mind, to calm the mind. And when the mind's calmed through breathing meditation, then one can see the nature and understand the nature of the ego mind. So it doesn't it doesn't it's not or it doesn't automatically lead to this kind of subject-object dualism, I think is that's what you're implying. Not at all. But there has to be wisdom in any meditation practice, okay? Because duality and non-duality, again, they're just ideas, concepts. And as one calms the mind, one starts to understand, letting go of all these ideas, okay? And even the idea of an ego is just a, an illusion itself. It's something we, we believe is real, but as things start to settle, we see, oh, that's just another concept, another idea. It's not anything that truly exists as a, you know, a solid entity. So Katrina says, I feel like that's a way that time isn't linear. I'm not sure I understand what we all time isn't linear, is it? 
time is just another concept. And it's quite helpful to function in the world so that you get to your appointments on time. But again, it's just a shared conditioned belief pattern. Some people think it's real, but it's just something we've created. And then people can get really driven by it, believing that the past is a real thing or the future is a real thing. Okay, so Amanda's asking, could you talk about the Buddhist concept of no self? What aspect of self is being referred to? Being referred to where in the meditation? So when the Buddha talked about no self, he actually referred to it as non-self, anatta. So he wasn't categorically saying that you don't exist and that there's no self because that's at one level, we could, at the relative level, we, only a mad person would say that. Cool, here I am. I exist as a self, kind of. But what he's saying is that within this body and mind, these five aggregates, five aggregates being the body, form, feeling, perception, sense consciousness, which is all the sense doors that we talked about in that meditation, and mental formations, what are called sankharas, you cannot find a self within this body, a permanent, unchanging, abiding self. Everywhere I've looked for it, I have not been able to find it. And I guarantee you, Amanda, if you go searching for yourself within this body mind, you cannot find a permanent, fixed, abiding, unchanging self. So that's what we mean. It's more non-self nature. Now, this, I'm just playing around with this idea that people want to go, therefore there's no self, and then they get very heady about it, very conceptual. And like I mentioned before, kind of going to extremes so that they cut off um, any, uh, you know, empathy or emotional allowance as a human being. But we're still, so we have to kind of, again, come to this middle way with this understanding of self and no self, non-self. So there's so much I could say about this, but it's also... Too many words can be problematic, and they are problematic in spiritual paths, words. But just sit, be with your own awareness. And as Ramana Maharshi encouraged us, inquire who, into the nature of the self. What self are we talking about? In the body, with all the five aggregates, with the mind, can you find a self? So when he, you know, his own practice was to inquire, who am I? You can find anyone there. You just found this pure awareness that is not a self, but that in the Advaita tradition, which is perhaps confusing for many people, they term self with a capital F, S. Right, so then the Buddhist guy, there's no self. What are these advisors talking about? But they don't understand what that self means. It's not, it's the self without the self. It's the impersonal self. So that question here, he, you know, his main tradition inquiry, who am I, is not supposed to kind of elicit an answer, it's to quieten the mind in realising, in recognising that there is no abiding, unchanging self that we call Amanda or Jayasara or any concept we have. It's not the body, the sense doors, it's not the mind with its changing thoughts. So what can you find that doesn't change 
And when we find that which doesn't change, the problem is people then start thinking that's my real self, you know, so and then cling to that as a new identity. Well, that's who I am. But there's still this smelly scent of the ego or conceit that identifies with it. It becomes the center of something that's not boundaried. So it's very, you know, it's very easy to get fooled and deluded by the way the ego keeps creating new versions of itself. You know, you might see this in your own practice that, yes, I've let go of everything, but there's still this me, this kind of sense of myself as a centre that thinks it's having these great experiences, it thinks it's evolving on the spiritual path. So whenever there's any one thinking that I am enlightened or I am getting somewhere or I am this stage of development, there's still an I thinking that there's someone there, then it's still the self, but just in a different version, subtle version, very tricky. Okay. In what are other types of, no, what are other types of meditation different from Vipassana? Um, many, many different types of meditation. Vipassana simply means insight, clear seeing. So really it's not a technique. Whatever meditation you're doing, if you call it a meditation technique or, you know, focusing on the breath or doing a mantra or self-inquiry, in order to really be a proper meditation, the Vipassana, insight, clear knowing has to be there in order for it to be a liberating type of meditation or a meditation that has wisdom. Uh, that's all it means. So don't think of Vipassana as a technique because it's not. It's a it's a it's an attribute. It's a you know it's a, one of the factors of waking up, and it should be there at every moment, clear seeing. Okay, even when you're practicing tranquility meditation, Vipassana is still there. Knowing, clear, seeing, understanding without the intellect. So Trace has asked, is your kind of Buddhism more open to other religious teachings? I don't know. I, um, I couldn't speak for my kind of Buddhism, but as, a, as an individual, I've always been open to other religious teachings. Joyce, sometimes I have a deep heaviness and suffering that comes into awareness when I sit. That's good. And it takes over. Any advice? It seems that the... It seems that the uh, it am gets lost. I think you say, it seems that it's real and I get lost or something. Yeah, so this is good. So when we... We sit, we start to notice deeper and deeper layers of stuff and that can be, you know, deep sadness, suffering, anger. So it's allowing all perhaps the repressed stuff, the unconscious stuff to come to the surface. But the only advice is the advice to take with any anything that comes up. Just come back into the, excuse me, the, the awareness that just watches because you're saying that you see this deep heaviness and suffering. You can only do that because there's an element of awareness there, right? You're seeing it, you're feeling it, or something within you is feeling it. So recognise that. Let, let that come into conscious awareness. You can feel what it feels like in the body. It's perhaps unpleasant, heavy, you know, maybe you want to cry. But just rec keep recognising what is it that keeps knowing this, that is able to just sit on the bank of the river and watch these storms and 
come and go, yeah. And that's where your refuge is. That's why I'm saying in that meditation, when we learn to recognise awareness more and more, which isn't hasn't got, you know, it doesn't come with all the bells and whistles and exciting things. It's just natural. So people don't think it's important. But it's the most important thing to recognise. And then when you recognise how subtle it is but how important it is, then you will give place your trust in that, right, and want to come back to that more, especially when these things are being triggered because it has the most power and the most transformative effect for allowing this stuff to move through you. And when I say awareness, it doesn't mean just come into your mind and think about it. It means to be fully embodied so that if there's pain and suffering in the body, heaviness, unpleasantness, the awareness is with it, just like a mother would hold a crying child, a crying baby. You're with it fully, but you're not identified with it, right? Because as soon as you get over-identified with it, you'll, you'll suffer, you'll, you'll drown. And as you say, it takes over and you lose yourself. So my encouragement is just to keep practising. You know, that's why I'm here doing this, these streams, is to keep encouraging people to practise every day in the formal, in the non-formal, until awareness just becomes, you, you, you know, it's just, it's always there. You don't lose it. But it doesn't mean that you don't have reactions from time to time or a lot of the time even initially, but you don't get swept away. You wake up. That's what it's about. Okay. I'm trying to avoid creating expectations, but sometimes they come out of fear. Yeah, that's all right. Don't try to avoid them. We all have expectations, and I assume you might be talking in relation to your spiritual the, the practice itself or maybe it's just expectations in life just notice okay there's expectations one of the interesting things about expectations i don't know if you've noticed you have these expectations about what something's going to be like you know a meal or a holiday or a movie or whatever you do um an experience and, and you've created it all in your mind, you know. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be this. Or it's going to be terrible. And then you actually go into the experience and it's nothing like you expected. It's completely different. And that can result in either thinking, oh, that was a dud and you might feel a bit let down or you're pleasantly surprised. But whatever the outcome, it's recognising that expectations create are just imaginations in the mind. got nothing to do with really what the whole experience is like. And in, in spiritual practice, they just get in the way because we're sitting there going, oh, my mind's so calm. Everything's really still. I'm expecting it now. I don't know what you're expecting. You know, it says this is kind of, forward momentum I'm going to get something I'm going to get something. it's going to come it's going to come and it stops us from just being present in the moment but having said that don't no need to judge yourself about it. we all have them they all come and they do come out of fear fear and desire desire is just really the flip side of fear um so just recognize it ah oh, here's another expectation I'm hoping or wanting this to be this way. And then even just consciously notice, what, what are you expecting? And then go and, and then when you go and have the experience, oh, there's nothing like it. It's quite funny, actually. <laughs> okay. Any difference between Rigpa, Dharmakaya or Clear Light? Well, Rigpa, and I'm not an expert in the Zogchen um, jargon or what's the word? 
jargon sounds a bit demeaning. Oh, I can't remember. Anyway, the language. Rigpa just is just awareness itself, clear knowing awareness, right? That which knows, that's what I was pointing to. Dharmakaya is, and clear light is really pointing to the ground of being, the source of everything from which everything comes out of. So when we, when we abide in Rigpa, abide in awareness, then at the very high stages, deep stages of the path, we start to really understand what this concept of dharmakaya or clear light is and that again it's not a thing these are new concepts for people to confuse people but dharmakaya is not a thing but it is well you could say it's ultimate reality okay oh i'm curious if you are celebrating in world long champa ceremonies this week just learned of your guiding meditations about this time last year. Thank you and glad to sit with everyone here today. So I'm not consciously celebrating the ceremonies of Long Champa, but I'm celebrating Long Champa every day, really. Uh, of all the masters, he is the one that I just go back to again and again. For some people, he might seem quite abstruse and wordy. And for me, who's not into words, his words don't have the same effect as other people's words on me. They just uh, they just go straight to the heart. And his um, elucidation of the Dharma is, for me, one of the most profound things I've ever come across and one of the most helpful. So, yeah, every day I'm connecting with Longchenpa and bowing to his incredible gift of Dharma transmission, nothing like him in the world. Amazing. So Bush Doctor says, I love the feeling of not existence. Well, if it's a feeling of not existence, you've got to be careful about that because this practice is about not about existence or non-existence. It's letting go of any feelings or any concepts. So if you're stuck on a feeling of non-existence, you perhaps, I'm not saying you are, but you could be stuck on a feeling of nihilism and leaning in towards that extreme. It's not about that. Because, you know, and the Buddha always talked about this, don't, it's not, you're going towards nihilism now, you're going towards permanence. It's the middle way between not and is or not existence and existence. Because both of those are just ideas or in your case feelings in the mind perhaps that you don't exist but if you're attaching to that feeling and believing it as a thing it's you're oh, you're off the path onto nihilism and nihilism is you know appeals to people who just want to blot out and uh, don't want to feel don't want to feel the suffering of the world. Don't want to feel their own suffering. Don't want to deal with messy emotions. So then we go, oh, I don't exist anyway. Great. It's all just garbage and we cut off. We have to come back to feeling the suffering, but with wisdom, with non-attachment. Because you don't exist, but you do exist. Hmm. So anyway, you, Bush Doctor may not have meant anything like that, so that's just me reading a few words and interpreting it. So if I'm not on the right path as where you are, just ignore what I said. Anne says, could you speak on bringing joy to suffering? Well, this is the opposite. <laughs> It's the opposite to feeling non-existence. Could you speak on bringing joy to suffering, welcoming, welcoming my sorrow over paths, hurts, etc.? Yeah, this is really crucial because it's about being willing to be fully present and embodied with, with what's happening. So when the Buddha talked about 
the Four Noble Truths, the first of these being the Noble Truth of Suffering. The reason it's a noble truth, have you ever thought about why it's a noble truth? There is suffering. It's noble because one is courageous enough and wise enough to fully come into that uh, experience of suffering. Because whenever there is a, a separate self operating, and most of the time the separate self when we're awake is operating 99% of the time, then we suffer. Now, when we have the wisdom, courage and insight to see the existence of suffering and not to push it away, but also not to indulge it or get lost in it, then we're on the path to coming out of it. So the second noble truth is that there's a cause and to investigating what is the cause of this suffering. And in very simple terms, the cause of suffering is clinging, ignorance really, but then, you know, because we're not aware of our own true nature and we're ignorant of how we create suffering and so we cling and push and pull and like and dislike and get into this trip and on and on it goes. But you can't force yourself to bring joy to suffering. But when, you, when you're willing to be with it and not resist it or indulge it, then I think a natural peace comes. You make peace with it. But you can't force that. And you can call it joy or you can call it peace or equanimity okay there is suffering and you welcome it but you don't identify with it you just see that the past hurts the past memories and they may manifest in and they often will as physical sensations tension pain in the heart you know uh, stabs in the back, all these things, punches in the guts. Can you just be with that in the body too, be fully embodied with it, but with awareness is there, fully breathing, understanding, and the awareness itself lets go. You don't have to go, I have to let go of this, I have to let go. Just ah, just see it, be with it, breathe with it, and recognize your awareness again and again and abide in that and let these other appearances dissolve which they will if you can keep coming back to this ground of of being which is awareness and when we do that when we we don't welcome it in the sense of oh bring it on i want to suffer it's there already but we open to it and we don't, uh, one of the things we've got to be careful is not overanalyzing it. You know, okay, now let me figure this out. It was because when I was six years old, this happened and my dad said this to me and my brother said this to me. Okay, that'll get you only so far. Probably more in more confusion. So let go of the analysis and if you can be more just with the feelings themselves and breathing into those unpleasant feelings without analysing them, recognising that awareness is always there, knowing, not judging, not condemning, and just holding it in a, in a kind of compassionate way. If you can bring, generate your own compassion, again, it's not something you can force, but just, just notice there's, within me there is something that's quite compassionate and gentle towards all these pains. And the more we can bring that compassion and gentleness to our own pains, the more we will bring that to others. And if we get too lost in our own suffering, one thing I'd encourage people to do is to stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about others to recognise the suffering of others 
and to have the wish to help others, right, even though we may not be perfect ourselves. But it takes it away from this self-centred focus on all my problems because, we, as we know, you know, growing up our parents always reminded us there's people much worse off than you, starving in Africa, you know, we get if you don't eat your food. So remember there's a lot of people much worse off than us and when we start stop thinking about ourselves all the time and think about others, <clears throat> not in a way that we get overwhelmed with the suffering of the world but that we, we have empathy for others, um, we can actually start relieving some of our own focus, self-centred focus. And um, it's not so important anymore. Things get perspective. But anyway, a couple of approaches there that you can try. All right. Emily, when I let go of controlling the breath, my body becomes filled with a strong life force. I can then enter trance-like states and become so blissful and stiff. Stiff. Do you have any reflections or advice? Yes. Don't get stuck in trances. Um, again, if awareness disappears and you just go into a trance-like state and get lost in bliss, it's... um. You know, if you listen to any of the teachings, I think there's a few up there anyway. You know, this is this is a danger. It's not the path. If you get they say if you get stuck in these trans like blissful states, you're simply just going to be reborn as a god. <laughs> Padma Sambhava says. So does Long Champa. And if you get born as a god. You don't have to believe any of this, by the way. Just let it go if you go, oh, what's she talking about? Um, you're just still caught in samsara. Right? So the it, because there's still this uh, this conceit there. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a blissful god. I'm st I've got powerful states. I'm not saying you, Emily, by the way. I'm just talking about the gods themselves. They're stuck in it for eons, apparently. But when that karma um, ends, then they come back down into the lower realms and get caught again. So you use the any blissful states of mind to sharpen your awareness and to see the attachment to these states. The, I guarantee you, if you've got lots of bliss, there's going to be some subtle or maybe not so subtle attachments to wanting them, wanting them again, wanting more, wanting to get lost in them. And you shouldn't be stiff. You know, I don't, want, I don't know what you mean by stiff, but expansiveness, openness is not stiff. It's flowing. So when you feel that strong life force, it's great. You know, obviously your mind is getting very... Um, concentrated in samadhi and you're you know in this tradition it's, you'd say entering into a jhana but when that happens you should be looking at the process of what's going on in your own mind in terms of clinging attachment delusion conceit and only awareness can do this, can see this. So don't, what I'd say is don't rest on your laurels. You see how attaching to any of these states leads more and more to just suffering of clinging, even though they might be blissful. But you utilise this clear, good samadhi, deep samadhi, to wake up so there's a recent teaching I put up from Ajahn Mahabua who had very strong samadhi for many years and was trapped in it and he talks about this in his teaching so there's the, the it was about four uploads ago I think three or four uploads it's called the nucleus of existence I um, encourage you to listen to that 
teaching from his own experience and how he managed to see through that. But there's also a link there to one of his free publications. And I think the I remember the first talk, I think, talks about how he was stuck in samadhi for years, just attached to this bliss. And um, it was only his teacher, Ajahn Man, that was able to kind of snap him out of it. So anyway, start start looking into that, start ex, uh, investigating that and see how uh, these things can become a danger, okay? So we're coming to the end of the session. I'm not going to be able to take all these questions. Maybe one more. Some of them are, I've kind of already answered, so I might just skip over them. Uh, some of them are a bit big to give a short answer to. Okay, here's a practical question. How do we know if we are escaping with meditation or still engaged with our worldly life? Can we meditate and stay connected to our everyday lives? The last part of that question, absolutely. That's the whole point. The process of meditation is to make us more connected to our everyday lives, but with wisdom so that we're really present with whatever we're doing or whoever we're with. We're not distracted anymore. We're not kind of, oh, my mind's here and my body's here and you're there and I'm not really listening to you. I'm on my phone. Uh, you're saying something. It's, not, it's about being fully present. But um, when I say with wisdom, with right understanding that, uh, well, there's so much to say about right understanding. But anyway, to be present but not to be clinging and attached or lost in ego identification. So the simple answer to how do we know if we're escaping with meditation or still engage with our worldly life, the simple litmus test would be, are you suffering? Is there still suffering? And only you can answer that question. No one else can answer that. But the thing about when you ask that question, some people all may, oh, I'm not suffering anymore. Oh, I'm just disconnected, yeah, you know, or they don't say that. I'm just, I'm equanimous, I'm equanimous, I'm not suffering. But uh, it's not really truthful because they're just repressing so we've got to be honest about looking at suffering and, uh, you know, there'll be many opportunities to have that test um, verified. Someone or something is sure to trigger us. So when we're triggered, then we say, oh, well, there's still suffering here, okay? Um and how long does this suffering last? How long am I fooled by it? How, am I, how long am I caught in it? So that if, if we're letting go of suffering more and more and not lost in it, swept away from it, then we know that meditation is slowly working. And, you know, are we becoming more compassionate towards others, more empathetic, more concerned about the welfare of others rather than just our own stuff? Because the problem with spiritual practice often is people get so self-absorbed. It's all about me and what I'm getting and whether I'm coming out of suffering and whether I'm getting blissful states or feeling like i am achieved something. And that's the biggest trap, the biggest illusion of spiritual practitioners or I've got the best teacher, I've got the best tradition, I'm sitting with the best teachers. There's so much, sorry to say, there's so much crap, you know. And there's so much crap out there now because, you know, it, it's, it's about spiritual materialism. It's just the same old ego crap dressed up as spirituality. And there's so many people on this trip promoting this trip and making lots of money out of this trip. But they think they're advanced practitioners, some of them. And I'm, I'm not thinking about anyone in particular. We just know this exists. 
or, you know, developing cults and abusing power. It's been going on forever. So if we're engaged in any of that, whether on a small scale or a large scale, then we know that we're fooling ourselves and meditation is not really working. It's just, it's allowing us to indulge more in our defilements, but dressed up in a different way. So we have to be willing to be brutally honest with ourselves, you know, to really look, God, I'm so narcissistic. All I'm thinking about is myself, you know. It's all about me. I don't really care about anyone else. I might say I do, but I don't. You know, this sort of, just really look. It's all just about my own attachments, my own likings, dislikings, insecurities, rada, 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 wanting to look impressive, wanting not to look unimpressive or feel like a loser. And, uh, you know, the problem is if we achieve success, worldly success, or even spiritual success, like I was talking about, blissful states, they're the biggest dangers because the ego gets to rest in itself, smugness, you know, and promote itself in a different way. So thanks for the question, Joshua. And I'm not obviously nothing or little of this may even apply to your own experience. I'm not saying it's, it's personally directed at you at all, but it's a good question to really start to open up to, you know, is it really working for us or are we just kidding ourselves? And I like your intimation that meditation is about staying connected because it is staying real, staying honest, staying authentic and not getting into the BS of spiritual trips, okay? So let's leave it there. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I just mentioned at the end that next week, uh, next fortnight, there won't be a, um, a live stream because myself and I, Jatinja, are going on separate retreats. So she'll be back on the 6th of March, same time, Monday, 8 a.m. Australian time. So until then, um, please, yeah, just be real. Keep practicing. Keep recognizing that, you know, it's nothing to get. It's just going back home to what you already are without all the trappings of the ego personality and nonsense. And um, I'll keep posting. I've got some really interesting um, master's teachings in the pipeline so you can look out for those as a way to keep supporting your practice and deepen your understanding so may you all be well and um yeah nothing much else to say we'll see you when i see you take care and uh all blessings to everyone and i end the stream <laughs>